Roger's also uh, apparently not familiar with suffocation. It's very quiet, and it works very well on people who are immobilized. And someone who's already been bleeding out. It would take pressure with a couple fingers, and you could nice and quietly put him to sleep. Sounds like we're learning a couple things about uh, Gene and Big D in this episode. Hi, folks. This is Lewis Hurtham, the original Peter Abernathy. Hell is empty, and all the devils are here on the Shat on TV Westworld podcast with Roger, Gene, and Big D. Welcome back to Shat on TV Westworld edition, the unofficial podcast companion piece to the HBO television series Westworld. My name is Roger Roper. Alongside me are my two cowpokes, Gene Lyons. Call me Theodore. And Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. And this is the deep dive episode of the week where we look back on episode eight and spend an entire hour or slightly more digesting, opening up new theories, going into questions. And then following this, we'll do our Westworld Telegraph where we do nothing but answer your questions and analysis and theories. So we're glad you found us. We are officially, gentlemen, the number two Westworld podcast, according to iTunes TV and film rankings. Well, that's all that matters, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Actually, I think that is all that matters. No, actually, you know what matters is the fact that people are finding us. They're listening to us. Uh, we're on everywhere. Fine podcasts are found. Uh, and the engagement with our fans has grown exponentially. I'm a little sad that we only have two more episodes to go, quite frankly. Let's keep it positive. We're going to find a replacement. That's right. That's right. Well, speaking of engagement with our audience, we've got a couple of things upcoming this week with uh, T-shirts and some exciting announcements. So make sure you follow us on Twitter and all of our social media. We're at Shad on TV. You can also find all of our stuff uh, on our website, ShadonTV.com. And you can join the conversation with us by sending us an email. We're hosts at ShadonTV.com. Speaking of those emails, just as we were firing up the old Zencaster, which is a software that we use to record this podcast uh, every every week, Gene, you found a, a, an email that was just sent in by one of our listeners that had a very interesting question that made us go back and watch the last three minutes of episode eight, Trace Decay. Yeah, typically, uh, you know, we're not going to do the you know listener email on the deep dive podcast that comes out on Tuesdays. Uh, but this one was exceptional and came in at a really strange time. So it was as we were just getting uh, started to record, JM writes in, love the podcast and usually stare at the list after each episode until I see the Instacast. I wanted to stay up and wait because I knew without a doubt your entire show would be about the ending when Recycle Gal, he's referring to Angela, the host, who stabs Teddy, looks at the man in black and calls him Theodore. Folks, it's not William. Is this confirmation that Teddy is a host version of a younger man in black? What else could it be? Help me out here. My initial reaction was, okay, yeah, duh, Theodore, Teddy is short for Theodore. She's talking to Teddy. But then we had to go back and look, and we saw some interesting stuff. Yeah, I don't know. First, I, I thought she was kind of crazy, I think, because it was clear, you know, when I watched it the first time. But watching it the second time, I don't know if it is. Either it's bad directing... And they, they weren't paying attention when they were blocking the shots. Because she's not looking in the direction that Teddy is laying on the ground. She's looking at eye level at the man in black. So I don't know. It's confusing. And in addition, I mean, when I was watching uh, the first time, I was like, man, Ed Harris has really nailed man in black the whole time. But he is really overacting in this scene. He's kind of like looking around bewildered and squirming against that rock. And I'm like, what? what is his deal? Like, yeah, there's some scary stuff in the dark, but you're the man in black. Who cares? Yeah, I did the second time through, I didn't take it as he was scared. It was more like, oh, shit, I've been found out. It was more like a realization that it was it was a ruse. Now, I, if you guys could see Roger, who is the king of the crackpot theory, he's sitting there shaking his head. So he disagrees. Honestly, guys, and this is... Th if you if you could just take off your tinfoil hats just for a minute, let's go back to Occam's razor here. She's saying Theodore. What do we know? What is the general rule that we try to follow here, guys? Especially you, Big D. What have we been told? Well, we've been told that Teddy, throughout the course of the season, is also called Theodore. We also know that Theodore is part of the Wyatt narrative. He's part of this whole new 
situation that's happening. When she stat, when she tests Teddy, what I think is happening here is Teddy can't pull the trigger on the man in black. And she goes and stabs him with the arrow. He falls to the ground and he, and she's like, we're, we're going to bring you back into the fold. Teddy, we're going to re I was testing you. You couldn't pull the trigger, but now you're with us and we're going to reteach you how to be able to kill newcomers. This is an area. The reason man in black at Harris is overacting is because man in black is, this is something he hasn't seen before. He's been coming to the park for 30 years. He's never seen anything like this. He's a little bit scared because ghost hosts, ghost nation, coming out the woodworks uh, and surrounding him. That's what's happening. You want to talk about stuff we know. We know that the man in black is knowingly on a quest to find the maze. He happens upon Teddy, who has been captured already, then is tied up and basically handed back to him. He then finds Teddy. Then he runs into Ford. Then he explains to Ford, you know, Ford is probing as to what are you looking for? What are you trying to do? Then further on, he gets himself into a situation where he, where Teddy is allowed to have a memory suddenly. Suddenly, Teddy is allowed to remember Dolores and the way Man in Black treated her and then ties him up and then basically hands him over. That's what we know. So what we're seeing here is the maze either being used as a trap or the Man in Black being misdirected on his quest to find the maze. When she says Theodore, when have we seen Teddy called Theodore before? I've seen Teddy being called Theodore multiple times. He does. You, I'll, I'll grab screenshots, and I'll put it up on ShoutOnTV.com. This theory that Theodore is Man of Black, listen, I apologize. JM, if if I really thought this was the case, it isn't, but you've you've tricked somehow. Uh, you're pulling a Dr. Ford. You're pulling a Maeve on uh, Big D and Gene, uh, smart, uh, factual, logical men who I used to trust, uh, and now I'm not so sure. We're not saying we believe it. We only went back and watched it. And if it is nothing, then it was a peculiar way to shoot that scene. Listen, I think you're trying to in, you're trying to incept me here, and I won't let inception happen. Okay, let's let's just move on. Thank you. It was a good conversation, but I, I don't. I'm haven't seen them do much that wasn't without a purpose. So I think it could be a classic misdirection. Do we want to put a bet on this? I'm I'm willing to bet. Uh, it, it's Christmas time, guys. It's right around the corner. We've already had a couple bets about uh, whiskey and stuff like this. I will bet both of you a bottle of whiskey that Theodore Teddy is not the man in black. No, there's no way I'm taking that bet because I'm not saying that, again, neither of us is saying that we necessarily agree with this. What we're saying is that the three of us watched this Sunday night and all of us thought, oh, she's talking to Teddy. Then we get this email and we go... And my first thought is, okay, do you not know that Teddy is short for Theodore? Duh. Like, w- like this is, of course, we didn't talk about it on the Instacast because it there was nothing there to talk about. And then we reviewed it, and it looks on second thought that, like at second viewing, that there could be something there. We're saying that if that is the case, it would be something that blew by everybody except for JM. And now we would go back and look at it and go, you know what? Actually, they might be onto something. Yeah, that shot was blocked. Way too peculiar. All right, so JM's, I'm going back to the email here. Let's go back to the email. Reading verbatim, he says, Folks, it's not William. Is this confirmation that Teddy is a is host version of Younger Men in Black? What else could it be? Help me out here. I have a crazy theory. Yes, all right. What's your crazy theory? Uh, how about the man in black? His name is Theodore. No. We don't know his name. William is man in black. Oh, hold on. Listen to me. Listen to me. The old man who's sitting there, right? Maybe his parents named him Theodore. If you're trying to convince yourself that that scene is supposed to show that the man in black's name is Theodore, I politely and respectfully think you're think you're crazy. With all due respect. JM, thank you so much for your email. Really appreciate you <laughs> listening. Uh, so for those of you who have never tuned into the show, we do things a little bit differently here on Shout on the TV. We don't do scene by scene. We talk in big buckets, big uh, overarching themes that we saw, and we dive into that. We ask questions, we bring up theories, and we ask for your feedback uh, so that uh, you have enough time to send us in your answers and your analysis uh, to hopefully make the top 20 on the Westworld Telegraph. Gentlemen, We've got a lot of buckets today. Uh, hopefully, we can get this thing done in under uh, an hour and a half. But there's just so much that we learned 
The episode title was, of course, called Trace Decay. As always, we start off by talking about the title and how it related to the episode. I think that Big D and Gene, this was probably one of the most obvious title names for the episode since the first episode, the original. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, You know, some of them have been a little more, you know, confusing or or a little more... uh obscure i think this one's you know a very obvious uh we're talking about trace decay the idea that there's a a physiological or a chemical change in the brain that marks a memory and then that will decay over time um and it's it's very important to understanding how memories are working for uh for the hosts and and how that differs from from human beings how and what how problematic it would be actually you know we think of our memories fading as a bad thing and people you know would want to have a memory that was you know like a steel trap, but that that could be problematic because it makes it difficult to tell when something happened, how long ago, um, how powerful the memory was. You know, if, if all of your memories carried the same weight, uh, that would be very, very confusing uh, inside the brain. So I think, you know, I think it's a it's a very uh, on point, uh, very clear and very helpful uh, show title. Yeah, and I think this kind of harkens back to the conversation that Bernard has with Doctor Ford in the beginning, where he's asking. You know, how do you differentiate between host and human? Is there a difference? And Ford states that he thinks there really is no difference. But now we see that there is a real true difference, that the AI has not only a perfect total recall, they can remember everything, but they also remember exactly how it feels. You know, and that reminds me of, you know, the actress uh, Mary Lou Henner. Well, she's actually one of a handful of people they've identified around the world who has a super memory recall where she can actually recall every day of her life. You could give her a date. She will tell you where she was, what she was wearing, and she can recall everything about that day. And it's also tied to the emotion. When she remembers something about when she's very young, she's back in that moment. And what's interesting about it, just the last thing I'm going to say, is most of the people with this condition are unable to keep a, a relationship. Very few are married because they never forget. So every time there's a fight, imagine if your girlfriend, if you had one, Raj, would be able to tell you every single time you've done something wrong. If you said, you know what, I, I didn't leave the dishes in the sink. And she said, well, you did it on the 5th, the 4th, the 19th. Then you also did it last Tuesday. You did it. So it, it stops them from being able to move forward. I wonder if we're going to find out this memory is actually a hindrance and it's not really helping them. Regardless if my past girlfriends had a Mary Lou Henner like memory, they would still hold that against me. They would still say, well, you left dishes in the sink on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday. Like they would still make it seem as if they had this type of memory. But trace, but trace to carry trace to K theory also has some criticisms, right? Like it, it doesn't necessarily explain why we never quite forget to how to ride a bicycle. You, you, you never forget. Once you learn something, you can't forget that. So can you ever truly forget something? And I think that's to me, what I got out of the episode is no matter how many times they reformat, no matter how many times they erase the memory, regardless if it's human or, or Android robot, there's always going to be traces. There's always going to be something that's going to be embedded in your memory that you're going to recall. I mean, I think that I've successfully forgotten the first five years of my life. Like, I don't recall anything from there. Um, but I mean, the question is, again, with an Android, do they, you know, and, and, and it seems like no. But again, uh, an interesting question to bring out of that or, or an interesting thought to, to, to carry, kind of carry with ourselves is is how human-like are these androids you know we they don't seem to have a computer up there it seems to be a a physical brain um you know if you put a screw up the nose it seems like kind of like a a version of a lobotomy um so in that sense they could have something that's sort of a hybrid brain or 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 something that does work on a chemical uh level in which case they would experience trace decay or some sort of again a a mix between the two let me throw out a couple theories here for you guys and you give me your opinion so you talk about the physical brain. Could it also be that it's something within their code, probably like it, like a, a line or two hidden away by the Arnold figure that we keep hearing about that, where he's allowing certain memories, the worst memories to linger on hiding out in, you know, in the, in the deep crevices of their minds. 
I mean, that seems that sort of a, an action actually seems critical to to real feelings. So if we want to talk about, you know, Bernard being credited with the reality of their feelings, the subtlety, the the nuance of their feelings, what does the man in black uh, tell Lawrence? You know, he's, he, he talks about how the when you to get to the real stuff, you got to make them suffer. Right. So it would make sense that if you want them to be as real as can be, they need to retain those memories that make them suffer the most. That's what makes them real. That's what they run on. We talked about whether or not we were going to try and talk about this in the in the podcast, but but it's so deep. Big D, is this the top level of the pyramid? Is this what makes people conscious? When you think of humans, the reason that we learn, you know, how we break out of our loops is we rediscover our past experiences. We we know that you know if I date this kind of person, bring it back to your girlfriend analogy. If I date this kind of person, they'll be bad for me. Why? Because I remember it, right? I it's not. Um, and, and it bothers me. So I don't want to be put in that situation again. Sociopaths, however, have been, from what I understand and doing, you know, very light Wikipedia homework, sociopaths have the ability to not remember. They have the ability to disassociate their memories from their present life, right? That's the difference between what we think of as a normal human and, you know, a psycho sociopath. I think it's, it's something that's kind of a, a larger theme than that. We see that people aren't learning from their actions. The park has had an incident in the past. You know, they may have recovered from that, but they haven't learned from it. They're continuing to do the things that actually got them in trouble in the first place. We're seeing repetitive cycles. We're seeing the death of Teresa and, and that even Charlotte mentions, well, you know, this sounds kind of familiar. She was very careful. There's things that are going on that are happening multiple times and people aren't learning. They're not doing anything to change the future. And w- without memory of the past, you're, you're doomed to repeat it. And the host, the exact same way. Without that, that, you know, that terrible experience, without that pain, without, that's the driver for most of the things we do. You know, the things that kind of shape us are those defining moments, and they're generally not pleasant. The other thing that I wrote down that might relate to the title, Digital Traces, so people that leave footprints behind, right? The activities and behaviors uh, that, that people do when they're interacting in a digital environment, right? So this could potentially mean the fact that Arnold has left bits of him behind in, in some of the earlier hosts. But also, Dr. Ford discovers that it was all a big hoax that, uh, that Teresa and Charlotte tried to pull on him because there were digital traces. There were traces left behind. What do you think about that? I don't think that's it at all. He knew that was a hoax from when he walked into the room. He knew it from spot on. But there is digital tracks that we see. And a better example of that is Bernard going back and erasing his digital tracks with Teresa. He's erasing himself from the video footage. He's actually erasing his footprints and his movement through the park. As you said, he's erasing his footprint. But just before Dr. Ford hits the reset and the erase function on his memory he has a flashback of him doing in another character we hypothesize that that character was elsie based on some screenshots i'm convinced it's elsie gene you have another opinion on this though yeah i mean i i I took what i think the i I bit on the hook that i think i was supposed to bite on which is that oh my god bernard snatched elsie that's who grabbed her in the in the theater but on second thought you got to think about some logistics here. So one is that uh, Elsie is on the phone with Bernard. Bernard is in the room with Teresa. She's reporting back to him. Um, yeah, Elsie is reporting back to Bernard, you know, what, what she's discovering in the theater. As she's doing so, um, she says she's got to upload that data. And then, uh, uh, you know, in an indeterminate amount of time later, we can assume, or I shouldn't we can assume, but I'm presuming is within the next few minutes, uh, she's she's snatched up in the dark by someone, and a faceless person, right? So I'm not saying Bernard didn't kill Elsie. I'm not saying that Bernard didn't choke Elsie. What I'm saying is that person who grabbed her in the theater, probably not Bernard. It doesn't match up time-wise. The lighting in the scene where he's grabbing her from behind doesn't match up. It just doesn't quite work out. There's two other options. Either it's a false memory planted by Ford, or Bernard killed Elsie at some other point earlier in the timeline. He could have killed Elsie five years ago. They replace Elsie. 
And then the theater scene has almost nothing to do with that flashback that we saw. The argument that Bernard didn't choke out Elsie is because he was, you know, taking a phone call from her or trying to reach her, right? That's the argument against it's not Bernard choking out Elsie. No, the argument is we see Bernard on the phone with Elsie. He is in the Mesa. He hangs up the phone. Elsie turns around. She stumbles kind of in the dark for about a couple seconds, and she's grabbed. You know, there's reason to doubt. It was, I think that we're, we're being led to to believe that Bernard was the one that grabbed her in the theater. Not saying he never choked her out at any point, but the question, uh, it doesn't wrap it up with a nice little bow that, oh, she was grabbed in the theater. Oh, it was Bernard. Okay, we're done here. No, there's there seems to be a lot more at play there. And and the question that I think Dick brought up, and or, or the point that Dick brought up, is that this could have been Bernard doing it of his own volition at some point. This could have been Arnold doing it. This could have been... Uh, uh, Bernard doing it under someone else's control, or it could have been Ford directing him, and then you know he he didn't quite clean up uh, clean up the memory there. And the other reason why I believe it, it makes sense within the storyline and the context. You now Ford wants to he wants to streamline control. He wants to kind of you know rein in Q and A's control over it. He wants to kind of really secure his hold. Bernard's back in place. You have Elsie, who's openly questioned Bernard, openly questioned Ford. She is someone you can't just let go back to work without causing problems. She's somebody who needs to be dealt with. So it would just make complete sense to replace her. I think it's also important to note, though, that we don't even know that Elsie's dead, per se. We, we see her get grabbed. We see her get choked. We don't, don't see a body. But Big D, you've done investigative work and you've posted this on Instagram, you've posted this on Twitter. You think that the host that's being built by Dr. Ford has got to be Elsie. It makes complete sense. You have a character who's in a position that can threaten not only Ford's control, but undermine Bernard. It would make logical sense to kill her and replace her over anyone else. Okay. And Gene, you're saying that it is Elsie, but it may not necessarily be Bernard in the time frame. That, that kills Elsie. I'm saying we see three things. We see Elsie get grabbed by someone in the dark, not necessarily Bernard. We see Bernard choking Elsie, not necessarily real memory. And we see a body being built. That's for sure. Don't know whose it is. So would Ford lie to Bernard? Would he implant a false memory? And if so, why? The The implant of a false memory could could serve many purposes, but I think the most powerful one would be to start reinforcing to Bernard what he is. To, to, to basically tell him you're responsible for this and you're responsible for that. And I even want to shield you from the fact that you're responsible for these things. But it, it sets up a very interesting paradigm in Bernard's head where he's like, oh, I'm repeatedly being used as a killer. And people tend to become what we treat them as. The next person I want to talk about, the man in black. We see him doing a little bit of monologuing here when he's out with Teddy Gene, you mentioned that the backstory of Man in Black seems to be a little bit fishy. Why do you say that? Well, earlier on in the show, we when we see Doctor Ford implant uh, Teddy with uh, you know with a backstory, he talks. We never wrote you a backstory, and, and here's it is though. As soon as I saw that scene, I began to question everybody's backstory um, because you know as as ford said you know we're, we're just basically the stories that we tell ourselves and that's something that i actually said i think on like episode one or two podcast was talking about that idea that what are we i mean like you, when you say who you are you're just basically saying okay this is the story i tell myself of who i am and therefore that's what i am but you could wake up every day and you're you know you could be anybody you just told yourself that this is your story so in that sense uh, man in black could be anybody he wants. Again, he's living whatever he wants in Westworld. He's living this fantasy. Why would he bring his real life into it? Why would he explain it to a host? Why would he explain it to a host that's his captor unless he was trying to manipulate that host? I just don't see it. And the, the facts just don't add up. What doesn't make sense to you? Okay, so his wife sees that he either is an awful person to Westworld or that he's fallen in love with Westworld or that he's consumed by Westworld. And that drives her to suicide. It's, it's from if anyone with even a basic understanding of suicide understands that that's not generally what suicide is about. It's not about the other people in your life. It's about you. 
And so, I, again, uh, it just doesn't make sense. This is this is twenty one hundred, presumably. This is the future. Women don't just off themselves because their husbands are in love with a theme park. It doesn't make sense. No, but the daughter makes the statement at the funeral that they lived in fear of him, of him going to explode. That he was a dark star. He was. He says he wasn't violent at home, but there's a good chance that this was a very toxic environment. And yeah, you said suicide is generally not done for other people. She could have been pushed to the edge. You live for 30 years with an abusive spouse and someone who's respected. He calls himself a god. He's a titan of industry. You know, he, and then he's, in the same breath, he calls himself a family man and a father. He sounds like a very complex character. I would not want to live with him. And he could warp my world to the point that I might want to, you know, take some pills and go take a bath. Well, also, we, I mean, this is, Guys, how many times have we seen very rich, powerful individuals uh, who are in the public limelight, who have, you know, many uh, charities? You know, he says he's a philanthropist. He's got a foundation. They're they're one person to the public eye. But then back home, like they ignore the people closest to them. And that may uh, be reason for even though he never hit them, even though he never acted like a, a black hat around his family, he never abused them. He may have just been cold and distant, right? He may have uh, never fully communicated, and that drives partners away. We've seen stuff like that happen here in the real world and in, in the in news. So I think it is plausible that his wife would take, you know, a set of sleeping pills and off herself in the bathtub. Yeah, and I thought we were assuming it was that he was violent in the park, that he was a different person. But I think it was Jez Bell on Twitter who had said it could also be the emotional component. That he was very distant from the family, but when he went into the park, he was a very loving man. He, he, he could have been the complete polar opposite, that he wasn't playing the black hat, that he was like the ultimate white hat, that he was almost having like a family, a second family in the park, and he could open up and love and be what he wasn't at home. And that would be enough to twist my mind. If I found out that my wife, you know, was cold to me and couldn't open up, but then she had, you know, a relationship with a with an artificial human and was what I had always wanted but could never get. Yeah, emotional uh re- you know emotional affairs are almost as damning as physical affairs. Is what you're saying, Big D. Yeah, it's not even the affair, it's not it's just he was that person. Why could you not open up and love your own kids or love me? You had to go to this park where it was all fantasy. Well, for us man in black it equals William truthers out here, is it possible that he married Juliet after Dolores left him out in the cold and he kept pining for Dolores to the point to where, you know, his wife offed herself. I mean, she is related to Logan and therefore she could be unstable. And I brought this up when I was, you know, one day I took like eight pages of crazy ass notes and I developed a full timeline where I thought, because I'm not completely sold on that, but it's possible. I just hate the whole William is a man in black. Logan's a man. I hate it. I just don't like it. But it would make sense to me in what we're seeing that William, he's feeling for Dolores. Dolores is having an awakening. So obviously now William feels like he's in love with something other than a typical robot. He feels like she is real. She's alive. If something were to happen to Dolores in the park, she gets killed. But yet the man in black has found out that it's possible to kind of free her and bring her to life. He could then be driven to spend 30 years trying to solve the mystery of bringing his true love back. And he goes to the park, sees Dolores, and the whole time he's tormented that she can't remember it. It's almost like that stupid Adam Sandler movie, you know, 50 First Dates, that each day you have to wake up and the love of your life has no idea who you are. Okay, so I brought this up on the Instacast, and I got to bring it up again. If Men in Black's motivation for being there is Dolores... Even if he's not going to call her out by name to Teddy, it's a little strange that that's not the story that he presents. That I've got to free the person I love. That I've got to, you know, instead he's talking about killing Maeve, killing her kid, seeing something he's never seen before. You know that that host, like you know, basically resurrected momentarily, and then the 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 impression of the maze, and then bringing Arnold into the story. All these factors have jack to do with a dolores storyline they why wouldn't he bring that up no it could very well be that 
he thought what happened then, he, he's in love with Dolores, he thought it was a one-time thing, didn't know it could ever happen again. When he kills Maeve, uh, well, you know, I just shot my own theory down, because he says, I've never seen that before. Bingo. So yes, okay, just right there. Woo! Okay, Very all right, no, that. let me carry this on. Let, let, me, let, me, let me see if I can keep this theory going. When his wife dies, he comes back to the park, which presumably, according to the timeline, is a year before what we're seeing, Correct. Because Maeve, we know, has only been at the at the saloon for a year. Yes? So after his wife dies, he comes to the park, kills Prairie Maeve. Little 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 Maeve on the prairie. Yes? And he does that because he wants to prove to himself. He wants to figure out whether or not he's this man that his daughter, Emily, tells him he is. This dark star. He wants to see if that's him or not. And he discovers... That that these hosts, there's something deeper. There's there's consciousness. There's there's an attachment that these uh, these these seeming robots that he's been around for thirty years. There's something deeper to it, and therefore he wants to figure out what that deeper meaning is, and he wants to see if it's if he's if he's truly in love with Dolores. He wants to see if that's real. Yeah, but the other thing he realizes is that he has no emotional reaction to it. So I think he, that's also affirming what his daughter said that he is cold distant unable to feel so i think it's it to him it's a realization of who he is well the realization that we got is uh our twitter fans have shit all over uh, our blackmail hypothesis that we talked about on the instacast uh there's no possible way that uh information is getting to his family that uh, then made her go and off herself is what do you what do we think back of that now that we slept on it 24 hours All I said was that his family got information from somewhere. So it had to have come from an experience within the park. So it doesn't have to be blackmail. If I want to destroy someone's life, it's it's not that I want to get something out of it monetarily or I'm holding someone hostage. So in this, someone gave the wife information. So I may not have been for blackmail purposes. It could have just been revenge. Either one's acceptable. Well, I think the big question here and is and again there's there's two camps guys did the episode present more evidence or less evidence that william is man in black gene you're vehemently still against this whole william is man in black theory yeah i, I was actually a as you said a william is man in black truther up until this episode um a lot of people took it as as evidence stacked in uh in, in favor of the theory. And, and I admit there is more evidence on this episode at, at stacked on that side, the timing, the, the, the 30 years, um, the fascination with, you know, getting to the core of the park. There's, there's nothing there that disproves it or, or, or makes it less likely. But at the same time, I feel like his story, the way he presents it, if he's being truthful to Teddy, then I don't think uh, I don't think the man in black uh, is William. If he's lying to Teddy and presenting a false front, and there's he has ulterior motives, then yeah, it could still very much be William. Uh, one thing I saw in in the episode that really keyed me in was the way William reacts to the massacre that he and Dolores find uh, on, on the beach. There, uh, he he takes a look in the can. She, she calls for the canteen. And he looks down at the host, and there's a moment of hesitation. There's a moment of analysis that we haven't seen before. Very man in black. Even more, she goes to get water. She comes back, and the soldier's dead. She gives William a look. Like, did you kill him? And they kind of go back and forth. And she thinks that he did kill him. So was this the, 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 the turning point? No, I don't think that he purposely killed. I, there's no indication. There's no proof that we have that he killed the the young Union soldier uh, who was already about to die from his wounds. There's no proof point. We didn't hear a gunshot. We didn't see him choking out. Uh, I think it's more the fact that it's Dolores' fault because she was down there you know, glitching out and didn't bring the water back in time. My point is Dolores comes back and even Dolores questions whether he did it. Roger's also uh, apparently not familiar with suffocation. It's very quiet, and it works very well on people who are immobilized. And someone who's already been bleeding out. It would take pressure with a couple fingers, and you could nice and quietly put him to sleep. Sounds like we're learning a couple things about uh, Gene and Big D in this episode. 
It just means both of us have seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. That's all. The the big realization, and I think the biggest proof point for William as Man in Black, guys, is the fact that Man in Black has never interacted with the Angela host or what we've heard, recycled host, uh, another one of our West words that will add to the glossary. We've never seen Man in Black interact with that host before. We have seen William interact with that host. And in a storytelling narrative, if you're going to do something, if you're going to keep dropping little clues that they have, like they've done with the logo, like they've done with his backstory and saying 30 years and the wife and all that stuff. Is this just another one of those droppings that when you add it all up, the sum of the parts is William equals man in black. I'm not ready to say it, but I mean, again, I, I think that the man in black story gave me some doubts, but everything else points, points to William again. So, um, so yeah, I, w- I would say that my first reaction to the to the episode on first watch Sunday night was yeah this isn't this isn't William. Now I'm like uh, you know I, I I could see it, but to me again the story just doesn't add up. So I think that he's he's lying to Teddy. Well, I promised you guys that I that I had a big reveal for this episode, and I previewed it on the Instacast. And I know we're running long here, guys, but I still wanna I still wanna present it and have you guys poke holes in it. So. We see Dolores when she's hanging out with William, right? She's she's seemingly recounting memories. She's going back and forth. We've seen her glitch out, what we call glitch out, and see different faces on hosts, like her father, like Rebus, like uh, like uh, her. She sees versions of herself. She's you know in 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 a past backstory when she reaches you know when she says she's home. We see that happening. Here's my theory. The biggest question or the biggest argument against the multiple timelines theory or the multiple time frames theory is that the, the, those individuals will always ask, well, what is Dolores doing? What is Dolores? Where is Dolores? Well, we've seen Dolores. We've seen Dolores interact with current version of Dr. Ford, right? We've seen that happen. We've seen her interact with current versions of Bernard. We've also seen her interact with past versions of what we assume is Arnold with me so far. Yes. Okay. If we subscribe to multiple time frames, I'm hypothesizing that there's three different time frames. There's the past when Dolores is glitching out. She's remembering conversations that she's had with Arnold and where she's seen herself in the past uh, with, um, other first version hosts when they're learning how to square dance, correct? That's the past timeline. That's what she's seen. Okay. That's timeline one. Then we see Dolores with man in black timeline. That's the one where she's on the train with El Lazo. She's, uh, you know, Logan is involved. We assume that that's 30 years in the past. Correct. I think you mean, I think you mean the, with William timeline. What did I say? Man in black. I apologize. Again, William is man of black. So when she, when she's hanging out with William and she's hanging out with Logan and she's hanging out with El Lazo, that's, that takes place 30 years from the present, approximately. Yes? Sure. Let's go. With okay. That. I, mean, I, right. I don't know if it's 30 years, but it's, it's definitely not the present. Correct. And, you know, we've seen different logos. The present timeline, Dolores, the answer to what she's doing right now is she is on a quest by herself reliving the same adventure that she had with William. So she's not only flashing back, she's flashing forward. So when, when, when people point it out on the train ride, you look away and then come back and then Lawrence and Teddy aren't there or Lawrence and William aren't there. Rather. There's also times where it happens where we see, uh, that, William is not with Dolores in this episode. So my theory is Dolores is by herself reliving and recounting the memories. That's why Dr. Ford pulls her when she's in pariah. He pulls her down and he's like, what are you doing? You're off on this adventure on your own. Why are you on this adventure? Right? You want to be the hero. What are you doing? She's searching for it. So that's that's my big hypothesis. I think that's going to be the big reveal. Dolores is having a sixth sixth sense type moment where we're going to get a, a, a typical M. Night Shyamalan huge reveal where this is all going to be pointed out to us in a memento-like fashion, uh, you know, in episode 10. 
if this is a Dolores centric show, if it, if it goes back to that, which I mean, she, I mean, Evan Rachel Wood is arguably the face of Westworld and, and people are, are, are big fans of hers. You know, there's, there's a Dolores backing for sure. If this ends up being a Dolores centric show, there are two possibilities that you just brought to my mind that you just evidenced. One of them is that this is the maze. This is the maze. This is the process you go through with the maze. You re- recall these key points in your life that bring you to a consciousness or to an escape or something. Here's the second part, though. I always go back to episode one, the original. I feel like all the answers are there, and we just haven't seen them yet. And the first scene you see in Westworld is Dolores. She's bloodied. She's sitting in a chair, and she's being... And you hear the... You don't see anybody asking her these questions. You just hear, have you ever questioned the nature of reality, blah, blah, blah. For anybody who's seen the movie Jacob's Ladder, this could be Dolores' mind winding down. She's dying or dead, and this is her mind just winding down. This is her death process inside of her head the entire season. That she's, that's why things are falling apart the farther you go into the story, just like Jacob's Ladder. Again, these are possibilities. I'm not endorsing any of these possibilities, but I do, Roger, agree that it makes a lot of sense the way she's viewing things. And the key factor is that she's alone sometimes and then things are there. It seems that, that it, it adds up that she is, she is seeing these ghosts uh, in, her, in her memories. There's another option. If your ultimate goal is to get Dolores on this path, whether it is a custom narrative like we've discussed, the way you get Dolores from point A to point B isn't by you know, telling her, it's by implanting these these stepping stone memories. They don't necessarily have to be real. If you want her to go to the that ravine that she paints, guess what? You have her painted. Oh, look, there it is. Let's go down that way. Oh, give her a memory of the church. Oh, look, there's a church. Let's go that way. These are mile markers in her journey. They don't have to be actual memories. They could be a narrative that this is their fed pieces of it, and it guarantees she stays on course. And the whole time, it's just a a plan to get William where he needs to be. No, No, Big D, I think you're missing my point. I think that she's on a narrative with William. I think that's happening. But I think that's happening 30 years in the past. She's reliving that 30-year adventure because Arnold told her to do it. So when she's Arnold, when she's doing Arnold glitching, that's present day. Like when she, there's a moment where she shakes William and she's not, she doesn't say, where are we? She says, when are we? Right. She pulls a whole back to the future situation. So she doesn't know when she is. So I think there's three different time frames that we're seeing Dolores. I could be wrong. I was wrong about William as man in black reveal with Maeve. So but anyway, listen, it's it's a tough explanation. I probably have to write it down and put it on a graph, which I'm, I'm too lazy to do. But anyway, that's my whole big reveal. I'm sorry for wasting everyone's time. So the next question I have, though, is when Dolores gets to the city, to the home, what exactly did she find in the center? Of May? What, what new did we learn? So... Maybe I'm the only one who kind of missed this. The entire time, you know, we keep hearing about the buried city. I thought they were they were not being literal. I always thought that the Black Steeple was almost a, a a marker, a memorial. It was something that they'd erected ground level. But hell no. In this episode, when we see Dolores and, and William walking through the town, for the first time, you can see the actual peak of many of the other buildings. So yes, it, it's true that they really did bury a town. And and that's a whole lot of work to bury a town as opposed to bulldozing it. So I, I don't know what must have happened there, but uh, it, it doesn't sound good. There has been some speculation that that church is the center of the maze, um, that Dolores' memory seems to kind of flicker and pop when it gets to that church. We don't know what's in that church, and the closer... You get to that church, the weirder things happen. Also, the farther you get out from Sweetwater, the the weirder things happen. Uh, Some parallels have been drawn between this and Lost. Um, Lost also used a church as the kind of final explanation point for the show and used the hatch 
which was a buried thing that they then got into and and it was kind of the core uh, for a lot of the story being driven around that. I hope and I think that most of the fans are with me that this is not another hatch that we're not we don't have another loss on our hands. So what you're saying is you don't want her to get to the church, open it up, and see the survivors of Lost in there. No, Desmond would be cool. I, I'd be down with Desmond, but no, nobody else. Maybe Hurley. Got nothing but love for the Hurls. Um, the next topic, guys, that I want to talk about is the music. Everyone seemed to lose their shit when they heard Amy Winehouse on the player piano. I am more excited by the fact that they are actually using deep atmospheric, icy synth tracks from the original Westworld movie, uh, it, it, especially during the Mave scenes, it's just adding so much like more depth and originality than this player piano music. But like, I'm kind of over it. Like, I enjoyed it in the beginning. Now I'm over it. Yeah, it it feels very sticky to me. And I've said this from 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 episode one. I'm just so tired of it. And everybody, and I tweeted out, uh, you know, earlier this week that that you know. People are just easily impressed. What's the big deal? So they made player piano versions of popular songs from the last, you know, 40 years. Who cares? Like, wh- why is this revolutionary? Why is this so cool? Oh, damn. Like, you know, uh, oh, damn. Maeve came back into the, after her upgrade, came back into the saloon. And now they're playing Amy Winehouse back in black. Because, see, she's back. And also, like, black because that's dark. Or maybe because she is black. I don't know. It's crazy, right? Or like, you know, again, with uh, uh, with How's the Rising Sun, like, look, I'm a massive fan of that song. Uh, and hell, I'm a big fan of New Orleans, too. But point being, so what? My favorite points, just like you, Raj, are when they do original soundtrack, original score. The synth is a very cool, uh, you know, tell to to the robot or, or Android origins uh, of the show and, and a nod back to the movie. I love that stuff. I even love when they do the orchestral scores that are just all westerny because it's it's you know it's it's that reprise that they do. That's cool too. But God, yeah, give it a break with the with with the throwback. Well, you remember we've made comments before that the first half of the season was very different when they kind of stopped production and you know did some adjustment. First half did not have that synth feel. You know, from maybe five or six on, it was kind of put in place. I feel almost like maybe they they were trapped. They started out with the idea of let's do the cool player piano in episode one. They realized it necessarily wasn't working, so they went away from it for a while. But I think they still need to throw some in there. So I, I know you're not a big fan of it. I'm not so much a big fan of it, but it doesn't detract from my enjoyment. Yeah, I just think that the, the, the synth... It just, I don't know, it gives the show like an electronic heartbeat. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, uh, there's just something about like when you, the Game of Thrones had that, you know, a huge orchestral, you know, original flair to it, right? The fact that, yeah, you can have these little Easter eggs with a player piano, but the real theme, what I should be able to go on iTunes and download as my ringtones should be this synth electronic uh, theme. You know, I listen, I just want that. So. They have it. Go, go get what? it. They've got it? No, they don't. Yeah, it's called Tron Legacy. <laughs> you can go download the soundtrack today. <laughs> I, I think more importantly, you know, if, if someone's going to make explain this away and go, you know what, the music in this show is important because it has an effect on the hosts and, and, and you want to go that angle. Even so, are you telling me that Maeve is and, and other hosts are reacting to back in black or back to black? Like, n- no. Back in black, maybe that'd be pretty badass. But no, but they, but again, in that case, give us some, uh, pull out some classical pieces that have really deep meaning mathematically or have really deep meaning uh, uh, thematically. You know, there's a lot. If you're talking about the expanse of music that you have to choose from, you could pick some stuff that is gr- that that has actual relevance to the storyline. Uh, and I'm sorry, but th- these are House of the Rising Sun. Please, please explain to me how the story of an addictive gambler has something to do with uh, with what's going on in the show. Well, Big D, you had a music theory that you were telling us before we started recording. Well, I picked up on the second viewing when Maeve, after the incident where her daughter's killed by the man in black, she is brought down uh, for inspection and you know, the, the techs are kind of freaking out because she won't respond to the verbal commands. They pull in Bernard and Dr. Ford, and they tell him to leave the room. 
the only way that Dr. Ford can get her to you know, calm down is he said it's something to the effect of, uh, let's use an old trick from the past. And he starts playing a piece of music, which is audible. The first time through, I picked it up that it was just background music, but he's actually playing a wave file that then causes Maeve to almost kick into a, a docile mood and sit down. And I think, you know, Gene had picked up on something even further than I did on what the music was. So Ford's actual statement is, is a trick from an old friend. Uh, and I'm assuming that old friend is Arnold. And the song that he plays uh, is actually Reverie. That's that's the name. It's the title of, of that of that piece. Um, and so in, in say, saying so, I think that the show is then crediting Arnold, actually, with the initial invention of of the reverie perhaps um or you know maybe it's an homage to him but in any event reverie seems to be actually the piece that that brings her affect down immediately and it's not the first time that we've seen dr ford play reverie it's not it's also not the first time that we've seen dr ford uh use music um there is a scene where Dr. Ford is meeting with the man in black and Teddy. And the first time I watched this, I thought that it was the phrase that he used with Teddy about his, about the past perils of the past, you know, whatever. And that recharged Teddy and brought him back online and, and gave him energy and brought him back kind of from the brink of, of death and needing a blood transfusion. Now, part of me wonders if there was either, either it was the music or a combination thereof. I'm still sticking with the with the with the words because the words seem to be the most powerful thing in the show, but he does play music in that scene and it has an effect. Yeah, I also picked up another very quick flash where it looks like music is being used for a different purpose. Uh, in the episode that Dolores is having where she's flashing back within the the town that's buried where she's with William There's a quick sequence of images of what happened in the town, the massacre. And one of the quickest is about two frames of what looks like a man with a small phonograph that he's actually cranking the phonograph. Now, he's playing music while everyone in the town is running for their lives, where people are being shot and killed. It appeared to me that someone was using music there nefariously to almost... The, the opposite of what Dr. Ford's doing, that it almost incites whatever the incident or the madness is that ensues. Yeah, so I just went back and I double-checked my my facts. In the episode where Dr. Ford is visited by Bernard in his office, the host that he has playing the piano, he's playing Reveries by Debussy. So we've seen Reveries be played multiple episodes throughout the season. Dr. Ford used the reveries to affect and calm Maeve down in the past, but now Maeve has some new abilities. What are the limits of her abilities that she has? We understand that uh, we're told in the episode that she gives herself administrative privileges. What does that entail? So clearly, I mean, we're shown very clearly that she can control other hosts. And, and at first, I thought that she was controlling these hosts as kind of like just a bit of mischief. And I thought that this is stupid. Like, whoa, that's, that's what you, that's your plan to, to start your robot upraising is to, is to just goof off. And, and what, what good are hosts going to do? They, they can't kill humans. So what's, you know, what's the point? And then I realized something after reading a lot of, uh, again, the brilliant, uh, listener mail that we get, there's a theory out there and I, and I love it. Uh, and we'll we'll go over it on Thursday uh, a little more in depth, but just kind of to, to brief synopsis of this theory, Maeve wants to get into cold storage. That's her goal. So she's causing all this mayhem, drawing all this attention to herself to get herself down there because that's where that army is. That's where she's going to find her people. I made this prediction on Twitter. Uh, we're going to see White Walkers uh, at the end of the season, and the White Walkers are cold storage. Now, to get back to your question, uh, what else can she do? It seems that she still has to use verbal cues, as we mentioned on the Instacast. She has to actually talk to people. But it doesn't seem like she has much difficulty. There isn't much of a barrier for her. It's not like it, it, it takes a lot of effort for her to control other hosts. No, but I don't even think the control over the host is her biggest ability. She has access to the Delos mainframe. She's laying on the gurney, and she's telling them where to go to walk her around. She has complete knowledge of the structure, where they should go to do the, the, when they're going to have Felix work on her. She says, make the second left, go right. She knows about the vertebrae, the C4 explosive, without Sylvester telling her. She knows it. 
So she has access to, I think, their full database. So she knows everything that's going on. She may be playing dumb, and I think she has a plan, and I like the cold storage idea, but she seems to have knowledge about all the safety protocols. She knows when the shifts are changing. She says, if we wait until 8 o'clock, the shifts are changing, you can move me up there. How would she know that? Is it safe to say at this point that Felix is a host? I mean, I I, 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 I hate to, to, to guess that far out, but she would not trust. I don't think she could ever trust humans that much. Now, granted, she's a master of reading people, but it just seems like the way that she can control him and the way that he counterbalances Sylvester, I'm just, I, I wouldn't be surprised on that. No, I, I think he's all human. She had been watching him for a long time. When he was trying to resurrect the bird, the humanity in him is clearly there. He's a sensitive, like loving soul. And she saw she could nurture that. He couldn't kill that host bird. I think she felt confident. And it was also a test. She now won't question Felix. I like that. I like that. Yeah, it was her old, uh, you know, canary in the coal mine trick that she, you know, pulled with with Felix, you know, testing him out. Hmm. Canary. So with that, though, w- one of the things I see with Maeve, though, is I'm, I'm questioning now her nature because initially, uh, you know, she seemed very concerned with the plight of Clementine. She seemed like I, I thought she wanted to, like, protect other hosts or whatever. But now she, she, in her mention of raising an army, is she hoping to liberate all the hosts or is she just looking out for Maeve herself? Because she seems very, very comfortable making hosts shoot each other, making hosts take the fall, be, you know, manipulating everyone around her just to her end. Yeah, she in the past seemed to really care and, and felt terrible about the suffering that the hosts were going through. Now it's become almost comical where she revels in it. She enjoys watching the them. She has the deputies shoot each other for no apparent reason. She could have told them, hey, everyone here is a law-abiding citizen. And they would have walked off. Instead of that, she thought it would be kind of cute to have them kill each other. So that she is not, she says she is a survivor and she's only looking out for herself. Yeah, I agree. And that, is there a comparison between Maeve and Dr. Ford? Right. And, and that's the thing is that, you know, Ford, she treats the, the host much in the way that, that Ford does. In fact, I'd say Ford is almost more compassionate toward them. But it is the question that, you know, people have said, well, well, how could Ford be a host because of the way he treats hosts well i think that you know we're very clearly seeing that this is very animal farm sort of situation on the flip side mave still has a very strong connection to uh her daughter um and also uh, she does seem to want to create intense mayhem in this situation to draw attention so maybe having people just walk off wasn't enough like maybe she needed it to be an absolute shit show to get the park's attention to have them come down and get her yeah, do you? I mean, we don't know what happened to Maeve when she when she's uh, taken away, but the fact that Big D, you mentioned it, and it's not C four, although I don't understand why they why they wouldn't have just used C four vertebra and C four explosive. It would make sense, but it's C six actually is what she says. I meant C four the explosive. Oh well, she it's C six is the vertebra. That's the explosive in her spine. Okay, I'm talking C four is the type of explosive. Invertebrae C6. Okay, got it. All right. Why didn't they just say C4 then? Because it's in C6. Because they're talking about the, the vertebrae, not the explosive. But, but it would have been just easier for them to say C4 explosive in C4, right? I don't know. Anyway, so when they, I think they're going to, I think what's going to happen, guys, if I could just make a prediction here, and again, I apologize for making predictions here, but I think what's going to happen, she wants to get captured to go down because she knows she has to have a total rebuild and they're going to take out that C6 ex- vertebra. That, and then uh, when, she, when that hole happens, she's going to get up and, and, and escape. I can just throw cold water on your theory right now. Do it. Do it. The entire cold storage is already partially broken down. They've been sitting there for a while. She could talk to the entire town and just scream out, hey, everybody, get behind me. And they would do it. All right. That's pretty good. But like before they put her in cold storage, wouldn't they just z- like, you know, zap her with the old with the old drill? It's not worth the risk. Just get up onto the the second floor, go up to a balcony, scream out to everyone commands. Just yell out, everyone, you're here to protect Maeve. You know, form a protective circle. And they would do it. Well, with that being said, who's going to be the next human to bite the dust and why and by whom? Sylvester in the study with the candlestick. 
I think Sylvester's safe, and I'll tell you why. Sylvester's safe because he he's just narrowly escaped death. Very rarely does a show put somebody in a precarious situation and let them survive and then kill them in you know, the next episode. Um, the thing is with Dr. Ford, not sure if he's human. Could be. I mean, I, I think he is. Sizemore, not sure if he's human. Could be. I think he is. Uh, so that leaves us with Charlotte, who I think is human. I don't think she's going to be dying anytime soon. Um, the next human to bite the dust. Uh, it's just such a hard question because I don't know who who is human. But of of those four, Ford, Sylvester, Charlotte, or Sizemore, uh, I would say that Charlotte is at the highest risk. And that's not because she's a woman. The next host to die is going to be me because it's 2.16 a.m. Yeah, I, I think the next human to bite the dust, and I predicted it uh, on the original uh, intro cast. I, I think Dr. Ford could bite the dust. I think he's going to be the next one. It's probably going to be at the hands of Bernard or Maeve. And we're going to find out that Dr. Ford's actually a human, just as I predicted. Are we including, are we talking about the present day or are we talking, are you going to go back? I mean, maybe. <laughs> no, we're, we're like, talking present. The next person we're going to see die? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, no, yeah. Anyway. Um, so guys, that's all I had to talk about as our, as my buckets. Do you, have I left off anything that you guys want to talk about before we wrap up and get ready for the telegraph? Yeah, I think the, the first couple minutes had the, the biggest reveal and gave us the most information with the conversation between Dr. Ford and Bernard. Um, Dr. Ford lets us in on a lot. He lets us know that the humans, that the engineers, you know, hit a, brick wall there was a limit to what they could do and his solution was to create bernard and by creating bernard they were able to achieve what the human engineers couldn't and he says you know it was to uh, find the heart um so we now know that at least bernard has been there with dr ford and an equal partner that he actually says he says you and i you know created this that Bernard was responsible for most of, you know, and you guys think it's the reveries, but I think it's more of the personality. Every other host that we've seen in the beginning was very rudimentary. They're, they're very simple. It's like old Bill. And he, he really couldn't understand speech that well when you, you know, Dr. Ford was talking to him about uh, the Greyhound. And he says, uh, you know, yeah, I've seen some battles in my day. That is not the host. That's the limit of human ability. You now bring on Bernard. He's had a longer um, kind of uh, experience in the park. His history there is much longer than we are led to believe. And I think his relationship with Dr. Ford will play into Arnold's death and how they worked him out of the equation. The point that you're making is Bernard's been around longer than what we've un what we've come to learn based on what we've been told, Bernard has been around for about 10 years. But we, we've even wondered, was he once a human? Was his son real? Was his wife real? We now know Bernard was never real. Right. He was created. Correct. So the, we now know that room that they have in the Mesa, all those employees are probably talking to fake relatives that are keeping them on narrative. So you think all the people that work and the technicians and the no, you're executive not listening to me, not everyone uses those video conferences to go video conference with home. Okay. They even make a comment that it's difficult to get connected back home. But if you want to use that room to keep the narrative and the cornerstone of the host of the employees that are hosts, that would make complete logical sense. So some of them are hosts. It would make logical sense that Bernard's not the only one. Also, interesting to point out that in this scene, you know, people always kind of refer to those beeps and whirs of those Generation 1 hosts. Um, Bernard definitely emits a beep and a whir, much like Dolores does when he's talking to Ford, which gives us an idea of the age of this of this model of host. So this isn't a new uh, host by any means. So he's, he, again, this is kind of reinforcing the fact that he's been there for a while. I picked up also, and I think you did as well, Roger. Uh, the the reference to Frankenstein, the you know the, the one man's life or death uh, line, and I think a, a lot of people noticed that. And it seems like a you know I was actually even tweeting back and forth uh, 
with, uh, with, uh, someone on Twitter where basically we were talking about, you know, the idea that she said, well, you know, I, I see this playing out like a Frankenstein story. I said, Oh, like you think Bernard is going to kill someone that he loves and then, you know, see himself as a monster and, 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 and regret ever being made. I'm like, God, I hope that never happens because it already did. I mean, this is clearly a Frankenstein story being told out there. And again, going back to the very astute, emails we've gotten in the telegraph these are all creation stories again whether it's uh you know american indian creation stories whether it's biblical creation stories whether it's literary creation stories whether it's shakespeare whether it's shelley it's all getting back to the point that this this entire show is built around the theme of creation and i think in that we're going to find the core of what it's all about i big d you talk about the whirs and the beeps and the and the. You think that it has to do with older generations, but you've heard those on which hosts? You've heard it on Dolores and you've heard it on Bernard, correct? We know that Bernard and Dolores were also created down in Doctor Ford's secret laboratory, based on the blueprints that we've seen, right? So perhaps the beeps and the whirs only come from Doctor Ford's special hosts that he's made. I'm with you on that, except for the fact that you can see that the 3D printer that he's using to to make the new ones, they're they're being constructed much in the same way as as the ones that are in the main facility. Yeah, um, they're not mechanically based. They have uh, they're, they're they're being printed out of organic material essentially. Whereas, why would organic material beep or whir? It doesn't make sense. Well, we know that it's not quite. It's more advanced, and maybe beeps and whirs are more advanced, even though there or there's organic and there's three D printing, you know, with it, and it's not it's not clippy, right? It's not it's not the the Arnold created hosts that we've seen in the cottage, but maybe Dr. Ford's organic new thing. They just beep in word. That's just one of those things. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Okay. So here, I just came up with an idea. I think I know what we're dealing with. You ready for this? The hosts are 100% biological. Yes, I agree. I think, I don't except think- for, except for Clippy and family. So, they are either clones, but they are essentially humans with a small component that allows them to be controlled, that is inserted into the brain. This would be a real twisted tale, that these are not artificial humans. These are actually synthetic replicants that they then, the only small piece, it is a regular brain with a computer-modified control module. Yeah, I think I guess I wasn't clear on this when I said during last week's episodes. Um, I mean, it's been it's been confirmed uh, by Jonathan Nolan that they are essentially human bodies. They just they have slightly different brains. The brain doesn't require oxygen. So if you so if you change that around, so basically the circulatory system doesn't need to get oxygen to your brain in order for it to function, whereas a human does. So basically, you can't like suffocate them they don't need blood to get oxygen to the brain the brain will continue to operate so you can get the body working again and the brain's just going to be right there it's always there so essentially if you can imagine just a human with a brain that doesn't need oxygen that's that's what you've got so so they have to eat they have to poop and pee like all that stuff i don't know if they can get pregnant that's probably not the case because that would be a real problem at at maves and in pariah for that matter maybe that's why pariah's Population is growing so quickly. I don't know, but yeah, it, it seems to be the, the case. Um, that when you're seeing them being printed, there's there's no there's no metal parts there. There's no there's no servos. There's no you don't have to plug them in. I mean, there, there's something going on there. And and I agree, it's a much darker story when you look at it that way. But but what is a machine? We're assuming that machine means metal, and that should never be the case. It's not, it's, machines can be made out of all sorts of materials. And if I can just try to close this up, because we started out with. You know, the relationship with Ford and Bernard. And you guys are questioning how far back he goes. Right out of Ford's mouth. When we started together, you and I, captured the elusive, the heart. We accomplished what the human engineers could not. When do you think that would... What time frame does that fit? Let me let me take you back. Okay, so, there, so once upon a time, there was this podcast that was covering television. There are two hosts. There's Dick and there's Roger. 
And then Roger says to Gene, says, when we started, this show became infinitely more interesting. And that third viewpoint is really what made the difference. We were no longer painting in primary colors. We had all the in-betweens, right? He's talking about the origin of the two of them together. He's not talking about the origin of the park. So so Bernard, I, I don't believe, came along right at the in, at the beginning, but he was critical in changing the nature of, of behavior. It's probably why he's in charge of behavior. So when do you think that happened? Are we talking three years into the park? Are we talking 30? Are we talking the last 10 that were led to believe Bernard has been working there? From being Gen 1, beeping and whirring, I'm thinking he's around Dolores times. Uh, so I, I think he's there from, from early on. But I don't believe that he was, you know, uh, an inventor of the park alongside. No, no. This goes back to my crazy ass theory where you start out in the park. You have the brain that's working. The body is the problem. They hit three years. They're passing the Turing test. But we see that the, the animatronics, they look like the Abe Lincoln in the Hall of Presidents at Disney. They're struggling with that component. You hit the wall. You need AI to help, which would make sense. Machines making machines. You bring Bernard online. He helps you take that hurdle. No? Ford isn't crediting Bernard with anything physical. He's strictly crediting him with nuanced emotion and personality. So if you really want to get into it, I mean, it could be a, a three-step. Arnold gets the, the, the brain function down, right? Maybe we're looking at the pyramid here. Arnold gets one thing down. He gets he gets cognitive function enough to build AI that can perfect uh, physicality. Ford comes in. He's the physical father, right? He comes in and he brings in the bodies and and, and revolutionizes the way those are done. And then he in turn creates Bernard, who then perfects personality. Each of them with a specific set of skills. Arnold, cognitive. Uh, Ford, uh, physical. Bernard, emotional. And that's why emotional, uh, why Bernard is so emotional. Yeah, it has nothing to do with physical. As as Gene said, what he's saying in the episode, what we know of, he nuanced their emotions. He made them gray. He made them feel more. Uh, and to answer your question bluntly, my theory is that uh, he arrives sometime shortly after Doctor Ford killed Arnold and then created a likeness of him in Bernard. Microphone dropped. I do feel it's important to point out, uh, and I think I've said it before, but in, in case I, I wasn't clear about this also, Ford, a big reveal uh, is how he feels that humans and machines uh, are essentially the same, right? He says that he said that there's, uh, there's no threshold that makes us different. Uh, there's no threshold that makes us greater than the sum of our parts. He doesn't believe that humans are any better. They just seem to p- believe that they are that, that there's a certain ego there and uh, in saying so it, it really kind of puts to rest if he's being honest it puts to rest a lot of the the insults that have been hurled at ford by fans saying that he's sadistic saying that he tortures the host and everything if anything he is a a massive advocate of the host and his godlike status a lot of that plays in the fact that he just wants to like a like a dictator like you guys said he wants to protect his flock and the best way to do that is to protect them from from free will, and to uh, and to have complete control because because as, as in, in a fascist regime, that you know that bundle of sticks together is the strongest. He's the China of theme park owners. He's P- Papa Ford. Papa Ford, that's right. Yeah, no, I um, I still think that Doctor Ford is somewhat a a hero in this story, but that's uh. Uh, he's killing people that's right so um anything else guys we're way over time we appreciate you guys we we know we've talked about this in the past we like to keep things down to an hour uh but we went a little over so thanks for sticking with us big d or gene is there anything else before we shut down and get ready for the telegraph on thursday i need to go to bed (laughs) big d's got (laughs) a Poor guy's got to edit this. So um, if there's nothing else, then we'll go ahead and we'll start wrapping things up. I want to give a shout out to our boy, uh, Lewis Hertham, the original Peter Abernathy. Thank you so much for doing our cold open uh, over our theme song. You can follow him on Twitter. Please do. He's Lewis. He's at Lewis underscore Hertham. 
Uh, you can also check them out on Netflix uh, on the in the Netflix series Longmire. Be sure to follow us and subscribe wherever fine podcasts are found. And while you're there, maybe uh, maybe go ahead and share that with a friend or or a colleague. Or while you're eating Thanksgiving dinner this 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 week, you know maybe you tell your uh, your drunk uncle about Westworld and how there's a podcast and tell him what a podcast is and how it's kind of like you know the radio only on demand. And tell him about uh, Shout on TV podcasts and how he can learn more about uh, the show with boobs and guns. So uh, you can do that, uh, again, Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes. Also, you know, have your drunk uncle, just take his phone, leave a five-star review for us. That's probably the easiest thing you could do for us. So make sure you do that there. Uh, you can also find us uh, in all of our crazy theories on our website. Just go to shadontv.com. We're going to have a big Black Friday sale with our Westworld t-shirts. Be on the lookout for that. Make sure you follow us on our social media pages we're at shad on tv on instagram and twitter we're also on snapchat search for shad on tv we're also on youtube and facebook just search for shad on tv westworld and if you want to email us if you want to send us a theory or analysis make sure they're really good you may, may you might make the top 20 and get featured on the westworld telegraph that release every thursday be sure to follow along with us as we live tweet during sunday's East Coast viewing of Westworld. And uh, after that, wait for our Instacast that happens every Sunday. Uh, on behalf of my two co-po- cowpokes, co-hosts, and great guys uh, who will never invite me over to Thanksgiving dinner with them, Gene Lyons and Big D, this is The Raj saying we'll see you on Thursday at the Westworld Telegraph. Thanks. Thanks.